So thank you very much. We've uh, sort of been running around the countryside for a week or so now and talking to a lot of people all over the place. And I can feel that um, right here and now, you're all at a level where a lot of other people just finished off. And I congratulate you on all the work you've done. <coughs> it's, it's really obvious to me. And so I, I can work with the energies very quickly with you. And, and you'll probably feel the energies rise fairly quickly uh, simply because you're used to it. I'll run through a little bit about my past, but not much. I really want to get into what interests everybody. And, and looking around, um, I know that that interest is not just superficial. So many of you have seen the interview that uh, Alan uh, did with me on probably July last year, wasn't it? Yeah. And, and in that interview, I was able to run through a lot of the uh, concepts that you already know. But the biggest thing was that I cancelled all the concepts. <laughs> and, and I stated very clearly that we all have done a lot of work and it's now time to forget it. Totally forget it. Because the simplicity of it is, everything that we need, everything that the universe needs, and everything that the world needs, came with you when you entered this earth. And it's within you, and it doesn't need any rules. It doesn't need any attention. It only needs you. The complexities within yourself are so exhausting that if you follow them, you will end up exhausted. <laughs> <laughs> the simplicities are amazing. Your ability to just be there, do whatever's needed, enjoy and bring into the earth all the gifts that you've been reading about for years without asking how is amazing. And we'll get to a point where I'll be playing with your energies and allowing you to bring in much more than you've ever brought in before. Knowing that it's not necessary for you to bring it into this earth. It's necessary for you to just be here. So going back, the reason that I can talk to you at this level is because I remember very clearly coming into this earth in the period from 1986 to uh, about 1992. 1986 had a major car accident and I can tell you all about the stories. They're all very interesting. But I think we're going to move past that on this group. And for about five years, I went through so-called brain damage repair. Uh, at the end of that five years, there were some really amazing things happened as far as everybody else is concerned. But for <laughs> me, it was just normal. All I know is what I know. I don't know anything in comparison to anything. And so when that major change was complete, I found myself in a world that really didn't know itself. I found that I knew what was happening with people and around them and I could see the energies and I could feel them. But they, they were quite different to what everybody else would admit to. Now, very simple things like um, I would get two signals when people spoke. One of their intention 
and one what come out, one that came out of their mouth. And they were very clear. And I got into trouble many times by answering people before I waited for the second one. <laughs> but I could see that everybody knew that and everybody could had this, had that ability. Because they all knew if you didn't match them fairly well, the the intention and the speech, everyone would know straight away you weren't trustworthy. You weren't honest. Yet everyone said, no, I only hear one thing. So when our in interpretation came in and I didn't know what interpretation was. Had no idea and I still don't. I just know the words because all interpretation is, is a failure for the normal signals, excuse me, to get across to you without distortion. Therefore, you have to interpret what you didn't receive. And so I could see that we were tearing our communication system to pieces. Our communication system is this way, not this way. And when it's delivered through the correct channels, it's distributed with all the signals and it's not subject to interpretation. It's totally clear and guaranteed. And so I looked at that a lot and I couldn't really catch on to what the game was. Everybody was playing this game with one another and then I realised that the connection was actually faulty. And with that faulty connection you had to start stealing from one another. It's just like if your power is not working too good you just jump the fence and plug a lead in next door and say nothing. And so we ended up with this direct pulling of energies from one another and pushing to persuade and covering to say I didn't do it and calling up things like love hurts and all that craziness that come from distorting, distorting anything that you could so that you wouldn't get caught manipulating direct energies and direct needs. And so I had a lot of trouble with uh, the, the ability of people against how they were acting. And I remember standing in in the, I'll say the woods, it's a bush in Australia. <laughs> I was standing in the woods and I often communicate very openly to whoever's there and sometimes as many, sometimes as not. And I said, you lot have got it wrong. You can't see a damn thing that's happening down here and you're just running off at the mouth. <laughs> Give us the right answer <laughs> and don't send the apprentice. <laughs> and then I, I got quite upset and I said, I want the answer to everything. I want the solution for everything. Not a big list that nobody can understand. <laughs> I want the solution to everything. And I stomped off. I was quite, a, quite fiery. And I'm going down the path and all of a sudden this energy came through and it buckled my knees. It was very, very powerful. And it seemed like a voice but it was very clear and it said, at all times think of me and nothing else. That is the solution to everything. And I sat with that for a long time before I could really 
make anything of it. And it's not so hard now because I realised that that's what I did but nobody else did. And if I explain it a little bit more, it says at all times, not sometimes. <laughs> and think of me and me can be the greatest thing that you know, your God, your creator or a butterfly. Whatever is the most influence in your life. And nothing else, not nobody else. So when you look at that, it totally directs your thought. And it puts an emphasis on no thinking. And what that does is it connects 100% of your brain to where it's supposed to go. And all the stuff that's written about, we use a maximum of 10% of our brain. Thought uses a maximum of 10% of our brain. We use 100% of our brain for the correct purpose. And when thought gets in there, it takes away a part of that communication system. And I usually tell the story about communication between two cities that's got the TV, the radio, uh, all these different channels. It's got movies and it's got uh, prompts and synchronous signals and tells you when to synchronise, when to switch. And each transmission from one to the other is clearly defined and it goes to the right TV and gets the right words and it prompts the technician when to change the movie, when the ad's on, all that sort of thing for many, many channels. So if you just, as an example, imagine a technician coming in and deciding that he's got to do a bit of an experiment because next week they're going to do something a little bit different. So he takes out some of the channels and he starts using them to play with and he comes up with a really good arrangement and he demonstrates it a whole lot but doesn't look past what he's doing and out in the real world everybody's getting the wrong channel the speech that doesn't belong to that picture they're out they're unsynchronized they're not blanked when they're supposed to be blanked and you get all this interference through and the world just goes crazy and they're running around trying to find who's got a TV that works because there's all rubbish coming in on theirs and they find one that works and the person says no you can't touch mine <laughs> <laughs> And so while they're talking to that person, someone runs around the back door and plugs in to their system and drags some off so and throw it over the fence and we'll watch next door. This is exactly what's happening to us with our communication system. And this is why thought is the technician that plays around and makes all sorts of great things that are useless. <laughs> And in the real world, all our communication is destroyed. And so the message of at all times, think of me and nothing else, is the total solution to everything. And you can prove it no matter what you do, what situation you get into. If you stop and make sure that you switch on 100% to your source, and do nothing else. Everything comes back to the way it should be immediately. And you all know about that. Otherwise you wouldn't be silent. So in that connection, everything is provided. 
everything that we've ever done, we don't need to do. Because it's all fed to you automatically. And many people say, well, how do I drive a car? How do I look after a child that's gone mad on the floor? <laughs> you do exactly the same. Because when you're driving the car, you know the person in front of you is going to turn left. You know that someone's coming in on your right. You know that someone's too close. And you drive with perfection. And the energies that you provide with that precision are so fine and so gentle that you can open your heart and really enjoy the drive. And it happens to you every now and then where you get in the car and everything runs perfectly and you get out the other end and you think, I don't even remember driving here. <laughs> and during that time, the greatest things come to you. They come out of nowhere. And if you have another look through your whole life, even the special events that you've really planned and put together and nothing compared to what comes into your life by popping out of nowhere. So we work with the unknown unconsciously, we think. But in fact, we work with a total connection that produces from the unknown the desires of our heart. And those desires are not known by our head. Your heart's desire is so much more than what you can conjure up by your head that every time something special happens to you out of nowhere and it's ten times more than what you imagined, you say, yes because it matches that desire that you didn't know was there. And so the excitement of being here is the satisfaction of that hidden desire actually coming to fruition. There are many, many ways that all this can be described. But it means nothing. It's just a description. And so when I'm talking to you, I'm only holding your attention. And I'm allowing you to connect. And I tell the story of how that works. That we see every day. And we do it, but don't realise we're doing it. We teach a child to ride a bicycle. And the way we do it is we just pick the child up put him or her on the seat, hands on the handlebar, feet on the pedals, we hold the seat and we say, steer and pedal. <laughs> That's it. And we walk along and we don't even realise that we're transmitting everything to that child. Everything that you could possibly need. The confidence, the synchronising of movement, the balance, the attitude, and the know-how to open to their own source. And as you go along and you feel your transmission is being taken on, you can take your hand off the, off the seat and we all do it and they keep riding. And they don't fall over until you step back or they realise that you've taken your hand off the seat. And the next stage is that they actually do open to their own source and they figure out that they've got it. The light comes on. It's, it's, that's similar to what I'm feeling. And they test it and you can feel them starting to go and there's one point where you know you can let go and they ride off, might be a bit shaky. 
And they come back and they say, look what I'm doing. They never say, thanks for teaching me. So we never teach anybody anything. We transmit sufficient to allow them to connect to their source. And we've been doing it for thousands of years. And nobody knew what they were doing. So we run around saying, I'll teach you. I'll teach you everything. You can go to university and I'll teach you for so many years and you'll be an expert. <laughs> and all that happens is you're tearing out more connections and increasing the ability of the technician to wreck your communication. <laughs> If you look at how many times you've actually sat and, and studied something, the best one is math. You go to a certain stage and you're checking things out and you're trying to work things out and then all of a sudden the light goes on. And you say, I've got it. You put the book down and you know more than, than there is in the book in an instant. And we all know that feeling but we convince one another that I studied hard last night and I learned it all but in fact you made yourself hold everything steady until you could open up to your own source and study is the worst way to do it if you're sitting with somebody who already knows you don't have to study. You feel their experience and you find it. And you ask them questions to increase your confidence that you're in the right place. And you leave nothing unturned until you're at that point where you can open to your own knowledge. And it's not actually knowledge, it's a knowing. And in reality, it's, it's the direction to your information source. You can pull from anywhere anything you need to do whatever you like if you can find where it's filed. And it's never filed in the same place twice. So learning it is not it. It's the knowing of how to access it. And that's why it's no use making any rules. It's no use working to laws on how to live or how to achieve anything. Many of the exercises we do are actually a simulation of what actually is. And we build in the play world frameworks, systems, rules, such that we can achieve many things. And you bring spirituality, religion and everything into that and you build it. The second you stop paying attention to it, it disappears. Because that's the nature of the play world. There are two worlds available to you when you come into this plane. And that's the play world, the one we normally make mistakes in, wreck everything, do whatever we like and fix it ourselves and work really hard to make it better so that we can do it again. And then there's a world of a creator, creator where everything fits and everything is perfect. And it doesn't follow any rules to say what's perfect. It's continually mobile and it knows exactly what perfection is for each person in any moment. Like it would be no use making a rule that uh, 
you know, when you're 21, you get a car. That's perfect because you might want to go, you might want to be a dancer. Or if you're a young child, you might want a teddy bear. And that's perfection at that time for that person. And we know all about that, but we still set the rules. And we still paint the picture and we still advertise everywhere and say, this is perfect. <laughs> so in the play world, we're kicking all this stuff around all the time. And in the world of your creator, you don't need to kick anything around. It's all there as you need it. In the perfection of everything fits, good, bad or otherwise. Black, white or anything else. And as we move towards inviting ourselves into the world of the Creator, we find that we ask a lot of questions about, well, what do I do if? And in fact, the answer is do nothing. Everything works automatically. We don't have to do what we do in the play world when we're in the world of our Creator. As you take yourself further into the world of your Creator, you realize that it works differently. It's like being in the ocean. You can put your hand out of the ocean and grab acid, tip it on yourself, and it gets dispersed. And it doesn't hurt you. But if you stand outside the ocean, you can have a shower ready, you can have buckets of, of water ready, pour acid on yourself and it's too late. No matter how much water you put on there, it doesn't work. And so when you're in the play world, it's no use saying, invite the essence into your life. It doesn't work. The agreement between the world of your creator and the play world is, the play world's yours, it's your rumpus room, I'm not going in there, you clean it up yourself. <laughs> and so, no matter how much you scream out, Help me, help me, help me. No, that's your problem. But you can invite yourself into the main house where everything is okay. And you don't have to fix the rumpus room because that's what it is. So you call it all these problems, but you just step out of them. If you look at what happens in life, childbirth, accidents, severe emotional trauma, you are immediately catapulted into the world of your Creator, into that safe space that holds you even when your body's in turmoil. And in that safe space there's a silence and a beauty that knows nothing about what's happening to your body, nor does it care. And so, in the world of your Creator, it's you that's concerned with that, not your body. The universal you that can be everywhere. And I can feel a few brains just going, what do you mean? Everywhere. You are right now, and it's not a statement. And I've shown a few of you what happens when I start to ask you to be different places. So I'll run it through again and you can feel it. And if I say, be up in a plane, on a train, looking down on the Alps, in France, Eiffel Tower, at the beach, on the other side of the room, looking down on the stars, you just say, yeah. None of you had to visualise anything. 
You were just there. In that state, I can talk to you and you won't have any qualms about anything because you are everywhere and you're not focused on anything else. You have no concept of soul. You have no concept of anything else or of any of the things that affect you because they don't. You are universal beings in a multi-dimensional framework and you have no problems with visiting anywhere, anywhere or anyone in a fraction of a second. And it's good to play with but if you play with it you find that you start to produce methods. And I didn't give you a method, I just said be there. And so I'm not showing you anything except what you already know. Everything you brought with you. You didn't learn about it, it's you. And your multidimensional world is a little bit strange compared to your play world. If you're viewing it from the play world. If you're viewing it from the world of your creator, it's just, oh yeah, what are you talking about? Of course it is. And so when we look at what's happening in a multidimensional world, you can see that there's no hierarchy. It doesn't exist. In a multidimensional world, the first thing to you is your creator or your source or your God, whatever you think. There is nothing between you and that. And it's the same for everyone. So there is no hierarchy. You're all totally different beings with totally different purposes and totally different structures. You're all built differently but there's no hierarchy. If right now we wanted a plumber, the plumber is the most important in that focus. And you give honour to the plumber because if, if the painter comes along to try and fix the toilet, it doesn't do real well. <laughs> and so as the focus changes, in this world and in the multidimensional world, those who are supposed to lead will lead. And so every one of you will lead when the focus comes around to you. What we've been doing is ducking back into the play world and saying, uh uh uh, I'm not playing the game. Instead of staying in the world of your Creator. And when the focus comes around to you, you find yourself just sitting up there, this magnificent being with everybody sitting at your feet. And when that image comes to you, you say, oh, no, 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 I'm dreaming. But we've all seen it. And we all know that we have that magic gift to offer to one another of elevating the person that's required right at that moment to a position that is way, way beyond anything we could possibly imagine on this earth. And on this earth, the gift we bring to one another is so important because we have the power to look at every other person and say, I give you a perfect life, perfect health and a magic future and the power in that is unbelievable. And if you think about yourself and what happens when a thousand people do that to you, you're really fired up. So there is a matrix between all of us and it's, I describe it as a golden thread that occurs 
when we each present our gift. And it's woven in and out by that presentation. And that's the connection that allows us to lift the whole universe and lift its vibration, lift its whole character and allow the unknown to be real. It's like trying to tell a six-year-old child that there's a Rolls Royce outside that they can drive. They don't know what you're talking about. Unless they're a bit older and they've had a little bit of training and a bit of base, a bit of experience to accept what a Rolls Royce is. Otherwise it's just one of those things out there with four wheels that doesn't interest them anyway. So the unknown is supported by our connection and it grows every time we get together and every time we feel the support of one another and from that you have the ability to bring into this world the unknown that would never be seen by any other person. If we look further into dimensions, you can see that we all play with them. There are many dimensions. There are many parallel dimensions and there are many other dimensions. And there are dimensions that we create. And if you sit around a table with a lot of people and you want to talk to somebody, you create a dimension. And in that dimension, you talk and nobody else can tell what you're doing. When you're sitting in class as a young teenager and you're supposed to be doing your work, you can dive off into the apparel dimension and go to the beach. And it's real. You walk through <coughs> the woods and all of a sudden you get a bit of a shiver and you find you've walked through something and you're standing in a whole different energy field. And you can go back and feel the, t the change. And it's subtle until you realise that you've changed dimensions. <coughs> if you walk into the trees, you'll find that there's no birds, no noise, just your presence until you stop or you gradually connect to where you are. Then all of a sudden you can just start to hear the birds. And then comes a lot of birds and you say, oh, well, they've all turned up. No, they allowed you into their dimension. And you go further and there's the more you invite yourself, the more you'll be allowed. <clears throat> and so you start to see the fairies, the divas, all the spirits that are looking after the plants and they take you in further and further and further <coughs> by allowing you to enter their dimensions. Thank you. And if you want to check that out, take a sensitive young lady and ask her to walk in and experience it all and watch her. And you'll see it gradually light up and light up and be so fairy-like that it's, it's... And you'll see the magic within the person. And you'll see that they're looking at things that you can't see. 
and their heart opens and you can feel it. There is no reason why you can't be that little girl or that young man. Because that's who we are. We're still that young person filled with the magic that we came onto this earth with. Each one of us can feel the body that's inside us. Each one of us can feel the youth that's inside us. And that is really what we take with us through all dimensions, through all lifetimes. And it's young and trim and beautiful and it has so many attributes that we're afraid to use. The outer layer of the body will match that picture. If you can see that it's possible. You'll see some people change so quickly when they realise that, that they're changing shape. They're not changing weight. And they will actually fit that shape and be very, very happy with it. And it's not necessarily the picture on the front of the magazine. Many of us are uniquely presented into this world And we don't really want what's presented to us. It's only the habit of the social input that makes that happen. You will find that you're totally satisfied with who you are if you feel the body within you. And you'll find also that you're totally comfortable no matter what if you feel the body within you. Everything that touches you when you're conscious of the outer body in some way annoys you. Everything that touches you when you're conscious of the inner body gives you a thrill. And I know the decision between annoyance and a thrill is very difficult to make. <laughs> but the brain will always make the wrong decision. <laughs> the reason for that is because our brain is there <coughs> simply to pick up the problems and repair them. It has no other purpose. And if you use your brain for everyday work, it only finds problems. It can't do anything else. <laughs> Works good, yeah. <laughs> so the problems will be manufactured if you haven't got any. It never knows how to find what's right. It can't. It just doesn't have that. The heart finds what's right. Always. We run a program within our brain that actually feeds through our heart. And it will totally nourish you as soon as it finds a problem and it will do it quicker than it can appear in, a, in the real world, sorry, in the physical world. Even though it is physical, it won't appear, it will just repair. And if you take as an example, a young child running flat out into a brick wall they bounce off, and if you're not looking, 
They look around and they get up and they just go off and play. And if you're looking, they bleed, they cry, <laughs> everything. <laughs> so there's two, pl two programs running there. One is the natural program that totally repairs before it can exist in the world. And it totally turns off any emotional effect and any sense of destruction. And in fact, it turns on a sense of elation that I've done it. Wow, that was big. <laughs> the Poor Me program that we run most of the time starts to hook your energies to whoever you can get it to. And the more you do that, the more the body goes along with it and it bleeds and breaks and does all those things. And then it stops the repair function until you go through all sorts of things to kick start it again. And when you kick start it, it just does it again. It does the poor me until you get sick of it. And so there's a healing time with all sorts of things. But if you can bring yourself to the level of that child and instantly when you feel the poor me program starting, you say wrong program. It will immediately go to the natural program that fixes everything before it actually appears in front of you. And that doesn't just mean the physical part of your body. <clears throat> that means every interaction with anything in your world. And your world is divided up into all sorts of things, but basically the world around you right now is everything you can see here and feel here and every one you can see here and feel here. So the part of me that you can see belongs to your world. And the part of you that I can see belongs to my world. And so the interaction and the interface between those things is not separate from me. And so the love that we send to one another is actually our own love towards ourselves. And if you look at what would happen if you reverse that, you can see what's happening in the world all the time. But if you do that to your finger, and you say, I don't like you. <laughs> You're not doing the right thing. It will eventually go black. It really will. Yet we try to do that to the world that belongs to us. But that's only in the play world. And it's done by engaging the brain. Because it only wants to see problems. Engage the heart and it will break through everything, even if you've got it screwed up. It never has a problem. It's so gentle, but so powerful, it will cut through anything, cut through stone easily. And with that, there is an immediate connection to every one of us from anywhere at a, at a speed that we can't measure. And so if you've got a you've got a family member, a friend or a lover that's overseas, you know exactly what they're doing immediately, all the time. And you know before they can get a phone call through to you. And Barbara has a lot of fun with the, um, the Skype because she knows that somebody's going to laugh in a minute. And she says, wait for it, wait for it. <laughs> and then it comes. <laughs> 
And that delay is what we've built in because we needed those things to prove that it's possible. But our communication is endless. And we've been through a lot of things in our lives and we try to look at how we can fix things and how we can improve ourselves. And when we look at what I've been talking about, you can see it's an absolute waste of time. <laughs> We're already who we are. And just like a big corporation, if you're the managing director of a big corporation, you can do anything. You can go in, sweep the floor, anytime you like. But if you don't manage because you're sweeping the floor, you'll get thrown out. You're useless. You're worse than the cleaner. So every one of you has to take on, in the true sense of how it's given to you, exactly who you are. And this is an area that's coming into play right now. Where we're all saying, well, who am I? What have I got to do? And as soon as you say that, you've got no access to it. <laughs> or how do I do this? You've just given the job to someone else. Nobody can do what you do. Nobody can know who you are except everybody around you knows more than you do about you. But nobody can take on that knowing. We can talk to one another and, and give you all the descriptions and tell you what's happening. But only you know who you are. And only you know your job. Or your not job. And many, many of us here are just visitors who are representing ourselves and presenting ourselves so that the vibration of the experiences that we have are available to the rest of the world to enable them to do what they've got to do to build a perfect earth. Our job is universal and the masters that are here to organise the earth are only looking for us to sit on the stage as you would the president to make the presentation viable. And if the president was invited along to a school presentation and he did any more to nod his head, say two words, shake people's hands, you would tell him to go home because his purpose is to be there. If he's there, it is a big successful presentation. If he gets up and says, I don't like where the microphone is and can you move that front seat, he's killed it. And so we can't leave a footprint on the earth in that manner. We can't disturb how it's supposed to be done. We can't get in there and run it. But we can represent ourselves in the full essence of who we are. And to do that, you do nothing. You just be there and don't react to anything and don't be lazy. <laughs> and there are a few things that help us do that. Knowing how our body works, knowing how our energies work, knowing how our creativity works, knowing how <coughs> male and female works. All these things we have to demonstrate. 
Our interactions are automatic. But we do need to be able to use the energies <coughs> and the interfaces in this field on Earth. You know, our days of just needing a football field in front of us and it happens are coming back. Everything that we have ever needed is there and if we need nothing, there's nothing. So if you go to sit down, the seat's there. We had that where we came from, we've had it on the spaceships. When we're here now, we've got to understand a few things. We've got to really understand that in this world, you'll never understand. And so don't try to. Bring into this world nothing except you. Invite yourself into the world of the Creator in this world and you've brought everything in. But there are a few things we can demonstrate such as using our energies, assisting people remotely, programming the consciousness around us and demonstrating the senses that only we have. All those things that aren't listed. The ability we have to know that somebody's walking in the room without us seeing it. To know that somebody's telling us a lie. To know that there's an unsavoury character over in the corner to be out in a boat and know that you've got to get back home because there's a storm coming. All those sensitivities are unlisted. We've called our senses up and given them a name. And as soon as we did that, we don't even know what they do. Our sense of sight, we, we say, yeah, well, we can read and look at things. So we, we don't know too much about that because we've given it a name. But in fact, sight comes to you. You don't look at things. The images come to you. The energies that are in this earth come straight into your body, direct to every operating <coughs> system in your body through your eyes. You put it through your head, there's a delay. If someone throws a baseball straight at your head, you either duck or your hands up there before anything can register in your brain. Everything goes directly to every sense and to every centre within your body and around your body through areas <coughs> that we've nominated as a singular operating system. Your feelings and the energies of this room will actually fire the spirit within you and make you jump out of your skin. You can be sitting around watching the television and someone hits a home run and you go, yeah, every problem's gone. Everything you thought you had to fix is gone. Even if you had a sore leg, it's gone. You must play with these things and see them so that others can enjoy the essence of what happens. To know that your active energies can just go out there and lift someone off a seat. They're trying to get up, you just lift them. Is a real treasure. To know that if you actually push down on somebody's energy, that flattens them. 
and that is totally against everything we physically are. We come here as totally responsible beings and we don't have to hold that. We can't even change it. And it's not somebody else's decision that we're irresponsible. It's your decision that you are a responsible being and no matter what you do, it is responsible. Even if you pull the wall down on somebody, you'll find that that's responsible because there'll be something in that that makes a difference to somebody's life. Even though in the physical world standards, it looks like it's negative. So understand that that's how you are. Understand that it's really hard work to make a mistake. You work at it and work at it and work at it and then you make a mistake. You put things down for a week without looking at them so you can lose things. You do so many things and you really work hard at getting to the point where you can make a mistake and you say, oh, sorry. <laughs> we are so accurate and so clear that we can see through the eye of a needle with our energies. And that's how we move past this world that is actually like strip mirrors. You walk up to the strip mirrors and you find your energy up and you go straight through the strip into a new world, the real world, the world of your creator. And there's many easy ways to do that. And I can flip people out of the, the worst situation with the simplest of statements. And one of them is the trampoline, isn't it? Somebody says to you, oh, I'm having this trouble and that trouble and oh, I want to do this and I want to change everything. And you say, well, there's two ways to live life. And they say, yeah. won't have any problems unless you stay in bed and reload all the problems like many people do and find they can't get up till 10 o'clock because they haven't finished loading the programs that somebody stole. <laughs> and that's what we do every day. <clears throat> and so the greatest way to go to bed is to be fully aware that you're going to bed for this purpose. And to make sure that everything's closed off in a, in a way that won't fall on your head in the morning. And if you've had a misunderstanding or a difficulty, you just agree that, okay, that'll be dissipated or gone by the time you get up in the morning. And what you do then is you actually go to bed and consciously... Do an exercise that works for you. But the one I suggest is that you climb on to that beautiful cloud and snuggle into it and feel your body and see yourself in the hands of your creator and feel the massage of the beautiful energies of nourishment that flow through your body and you'll go to sleep in that state which is above all activities that have previously disturbed you and when you wake in the morning totally fresh with a clean life force you'll open your eyes and everything will be so brilliant 
so beautiful that you'll look around and you won't understand how you didn't see the things on the wall or the pictures or you didn't see the view outside and you really didn't see how beautiful your wife was or your husband and you'll get up and walk around the house with eyes this big thinking wow look at that and the brilliance of that every day is what we have to look forward to and the excitement of it is what we pass on to our children, to our friends and to everyone we touch during the day. So when you walk along the street, that freshness, that ability to expand actually turns heads. And ladies, you'll enjoy it. It is what you're supposed to do. It is so important to the health and well-being of everything in this world. And you watch the animals, they'll pick it up straight away. They'll feel your energy, they'll be so happy and healthy. And you'll find that there'll be no attraction to anything but healthy food. And you won't have to program it. You won't have to say, oh, I'm searching for it. You'll just walk up to what works. Because you've started with this openness and the beauty of your physical body and its interaction and interface with the world. And it's really important to show people that that interface is programmable very, very quickly. It's just like you walk on hot coals, you don't get burnt. Many people have proven that. If you decide that interface is such that it doesn't follow any rules except yours. What you do for people in an instant it's exactly like that interface. It's based on how you want it to be. And so we can affect the world in an instant just by programming the interface between us and the world. And it does work. And even science has proven lots of things to you, but they leave a lot out. You know, the people say, um, you are what you eat. Cows, not grass. <laughs> and, you know, they haven't yet found out where the calcium comes from in the milk. There's nothing a cow eats that's got calcium in it. But they conveni conveniently leave that out because it's too hard. <laughs> and it's just like the science of the atom they draw the atom and all the electrons and the neutrons and positrons and all the other bits and they never tell you what's in the gap what about the rest of it the big bit you know <laughs> they just leave it out because they can't explain it and then they tell you that we're not all connected because they left out the big bit that's connected in everything. And that big bit is in everything. There's a gap in every atom. And that's how we're connected. And that is your creator. And that's why someone had it right once and said God is everywhere. Because they had a feel for it. But it's actually that gap that everybody left out in science. That they're now saying, oh, there is an energy. We haven't got it yet, but there's many of them. And we can do these things. <laughs> but in fact, we instantly work with that gap and we program in an instant whatever we want to program 
in our active energies that we send out to people, to things, and in the consciousness around us. And so when somebody says, financial situation is terrible and it's falling to pieces, and we, we've only got to be convinced for one second and we reprogram the consciousness, consciousness around us. The propaganda does nothing except convince us to work our magic backwards. And so in an instant, you can work your magic and put it back. And that's what I encourage you all to show. That in an instant, you can put everything to where it should be as long as you don't use your brain. You use your heart and you use the program that, that came with you. And every individual knows how to do that. And all you say is nothing. You just allow it to happen just as you would if someone threw the ball at you. Mm. It just happens. And you don't give it a name like a reflex because that's rubbish. It's actually a full sense of exactly what's happening and a signal to various parts of your body to respond. And if we look further at what our brain tells us every day, you can see that um, we all talk about I'm sensitive or I'm too sensitive or you know my skin's playing up because of sensitivity or I've got an allergy. And in fact, we believe that we're too sensitive. It's actually a reaction. How can it be a sensitivity? Everything we talk about as sensitive is, is a reaction. And we never ever point to the fact that the reaction is there because the sensitivity of our signaling system has been turned down. Just like the child running into the wall. The reason they're okay is because their sensitivity is right up and it's so fast that it happens before it comes into the physical vision. And so when you've got all these things that you're talking about with sensitivity, remember it's back to front because that's what the brain does. Okay. One of the things I wanted to talk about was how we all come into one another's lives. And, and I'd like to call on Barbara about to tell you how we actually got together. And you'll see that this is what happens to you almost every day. And you don't realise it. I so, you the time. I know. You telling me to tell the time. Yeah. <laughs> I caught you. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Go back to Janu January 2009. I was taking the first course of Avatar. Not the movie, but the course. <laughs> and there are three sections. Avatar, Masters, and Wizards. I was just going to Orlando to take Avatar. But I got very intrigued with the idea of being a wizard. So I asked how I could, I wanted to make myself ready to take wizards, but you have to take that master's. Well, the dates were wrong, it didn't serve. And they were giving the master's course after the wizard's course was presented. And so on. they said, we'll just wait a year. I said, no. So some, I still remember her. She came sidling over to me and she said, I know how you can take wizards. And I said, how? She said, well, they're giving masters in Australia. Mm -hmm. I went, are you crazy? Mm -hmm. I'm not going to go to Australia to take a course. <laughs> well, <laughs> it turns out that there were five of us who wanted to take wizards. So we decided 
oh well, let's go. <laughs> and you used to talk about how teenagers don't think. They just go. Yes. Well, I guess I became a teenager. And, uh, but it was kind of hard telling my kids I was going to Australia. But at any rate, um, I went there, I took masters, and, I, and then there was three weeks before Wizards. So I'm not going to run back to Orlando. I'm in Australia. I want to see this country. And there was this 25-year-old guy named Vince. He said, well, I'll go with you. I said, fine. I never thought of where I was going, how I was going to pay for it, and where would we stay. It didn't occur to me. At any rate, the last day of the, week, of the course, this wonderful guy by the name of Paul said, why don't you take our company van? We said, oh, thanks. <laughs> and then uh, six people from the course said, oh, you have to visit me. Uh, you have to come to visit me. <laughs> You have to come to visit me. I said yes to everybody. <laughs> and it was like, here you are in Ojai, and you have to come and visit me. I live in Milwaukee. I just, so I said yes. And it all worked. It all worked. I just kept saying yes. So we went to Bellarat, and we went to Geelong, and we went to Melbourne, and we went to Sydney. But the thing that was outstanding was this last day of the course, this big, I don't want to say that. Yeah, you can. <laughs> <laughs> well, this very voluptuous, wonderful woman yes. clasped me to her bosom and said, well, of course you're coming to Newcastle. I said, okay. So we drove 12 hours and went to Newcastle. And we, I walked into their house and Christina and Graham decided I have to meet Bob. So I said, okay. <laughs> and um, they said, well, he'll come if he feels like it. <laughs> I said, feels like it. Who's this? So the next day, uh, Graham had taken me for a tour. And I remember the phone call came in that Bob has arrived. And uh, I couldn't wait to go meet Bob. But Graham wanted to take me. Or I said, let's go. Let's go. So we came in. And he was sitting there, like that. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, oh. And somehow or other, I just felt as though I had known him. But as the evening went on, I was positive that I knew him. Or I certainly wanted to know him. And the one thing that stayed, out, stayed in my mind was, you know, when you meet someone, you say, well, I'm an engineer, or I'm an energy healer, or I work by a theater. He said, I don't want to know what you do. I want to know you. I went, who is this man? <laughs> well, I'll just give you the details. Here we went. We had dinner. I hated when he went home. Sunday uh, was interminable, but he came and we went out for dinner. <laughs> and then Monday, he had invited Vince and me for breakfast. And he rang the doorbell at 9 o'clock in the morning, and Vince was sleeping, so I didn't wake him up. <laughs> 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 and we talked, and it was just wonderful. So we had this three-hour breakfast, and then we felt a little, I felt a little guilty because Vince learned about a portal at the beach, and I believe that's my cell phone. Yeah, that was Evans. Sorry. <laughs> and we, he took us to a portal on the beach, which was thrilling because I experienced something I'd never even known, but maybe I have experienced it, but there was no one there to tell me what I was experiencing. And you walk through and he said, did you feel anything? <laughs> he said, walk back. And we felt something. And it was very magical. It was very wonderful. So um, we drove home. We said goodbye, there was a brief hug, and we went back, and I went back to take wizards. That was it. Christina was my roommate at Wizards. She's the one who introduced us. And I kept saying, you know, I'm having the time of my life. I don't know what I'm gonna do at the end of this course. She said, what are you thinking about? You're coming back to Australia. 
I said, how? Why? Uh, I, he hadn't said anything. <laughs> and she said, I don't know what's taking him so long. <laughs> She's psychic. I said, how can you just say that? What's the matter with him? You're supposed to come to Australia. Well, what happened is I started to get up at 3 in the morning. Because there was a, an email from Robert. I answered him. By the time I got up in the morning, there was an answer. And this went back and forth. I was more excited about the emails than wizards. <laughs> and all of a sudden, uh, he said, here's my credit card. Buy a flight to Australia. And that was March 3rd. <laughs> <laughs> so it's just been magical. And as one interviewer said, you just kept saying yes. And I had spent a heck of a long time saying no a lot. But I decided yes is better. <laughs> so we have traveled. We came back to the States in May, ostensibly to meet my family. Well, we met Alan Steinfeld, <laughs> and he did his YouTube, and 30,000 people have watched it around the world. And I have a ton of emails. <laughs> and the reason we're sitting here tonight is because I answered one Marion Grace from Petaluma. She said, would you consider coming to Northern California? And Robert said, yeah, I think we should go. But this is when we were in Australia. <laughs> well, I'll, I, I better hurry up. <laughs> um, so we came in May, we came in July, we came in October because there was a conference in Orlando, had nothing to do with wizards. We came up and because if you go to our website, there's a PDF of Robert's magnificent book called The Magic of Life. And download it, channeled, what word do you like? He just talked just into a tape and recorder and told this magnifi magnificent story. And, um, and it's a novel. And it's a novel, but it's really a movie. <laughs> I see the movie. I see the movie. And we're going to meet the person who says, I want to write the screenplay. So, so one man read the book and he, he emailed you and he thanked you for a new template for living. And that man has started the Lightworker Summits in Boston. So we went the first weekend to Boston, the second weekend to get married, mm -hmm. and the third weekend a retreat in Pennsylvania, where Alan told us that there was a portal that needed to be opened. So Robert opened the portal. And then that's where we're living now. <laughs> I just jumped. <laughs> so that's the quick story. But it's so much fun. <laughs> 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 <laughs>